Hello, my dear students, and welcome to my MacBook. I hope uh, this goes well. I usually record on my iPad, but I wanted to get our first material for our course up and a quick lecture and explanation of that material posted today, the first day of class. I just got access to the class yesterday on the weekend, and I'm working from home and having uh, rural Arkansas internet speeds. I've, lectured, I've um, prepared a, a brief welcome and little explanation and overview of the course and starting from last night to uh, this morning it is only 40 percent uploaded so i'm going to record this introductory material real quickly and go on into campus where I get the blinding speeds of the Aeron Network, which is the Arkansas Educational and Research Optical Network, Aeron, and it is wonderful. If you have any trouble with computers, and I see my students sitting in the McDonald's parking lot uh, uploading their assignments and everything all the time, but if you can go into campus and use one of the student computer labs, you'll find sometimes it's worth the drive in because it's just so much faster. Of course, the problem is planning around when they are open and when you can go in. So let me um, leave some exposition for later and start with our first chapter and our material from our book. Um, it's Chemistry, the Central Science by Brown and LeMay et al. and others. And I say that because many years ago, this was a book by Brown and LeMay. And since that time, other authors have come in to um, update and improve the text and I believe we are using the 13th edition and I hope these lecture slides match the edition that you have. That being said, uh, if you have a different or older edition of the book it won't matter and uh, later I'm going to give you some information about a website that has all this material organized, I don't know how that happened, organized along the lines of the books so that we can um, uh, basically use open education resources in addition to our textbooks. But I'm going to follow the organization and layout and order of our textbook and quickly in a single lecture cover chapter one. The next material for chapter two where we start our study of chemistry in earnest uh, is very important. It's also a very broad and overarching chapter on atoms, molecules, and ions and I will divide that into three separate lectures. So, if I may, uh, this chapter introduces chemistry uh, and introduces it as a quantitative science where measurements are property. So, I always like to say chemistry is the study of matter and the reactions it undergoes. Your book sort of paraphrases that philosophy as chemistry being the study of the properties and the behavior of matter. And I don't have to tell you that chemistry is related to not many science-related fields. I would say every 
science-related fields, whether it's physics or quantum physics or uh, biology, biochemistry, medicine, all those require basic understanding of chemical processes. So matter, you know, if chemistry is a study of matter and the reactions it undergoes, the first question then is, what's matter? And of course the joke is, I don't know, what's matter with you? But matter is anything that has mass and takes up space. And I hope long ago you saw simple experiments and demonstrations in your science classes, for example, blowing up a balloon with air and measuring its mass to see that, yes, air co is constituted of, made up of matter and has mass. You know, it weighs something. If you don't have matter, you are basically talking vacuum. Uh, anyway. All matter is made up of atoms, and they're the basic building blocks of stuff. And the atoms that we find making up matter differ, and the different atoms correspond to different elements. If two atoms are the same, they're the same element, and if two atoms are different, there are different elements, and a corollary would be different elements are made up of different atoms. Uh, each element, each different element is made up of a unique, different kind of atom. And one of the ways we get from 100 plus, 120 uh, or so elements, the vast, you know, just incomprehensible diversity of stuff, of matter, is we take those atoms and we combine them in different ways. And when you combine or compound those atoms, you form a compound, a substance made up of two or more different kind of atoms. Of course, a classic example would be what? Water. You know, it's H2O, two little white hydrogens and one oxygen and one red oxygen. And we'll talk about depicting molecular models and the colors are very specified and the size of these space-filling uh, models of atoms that we see here. We depict them as little round balls for now. Now, uh, just briefly, how do we classify matter? Usually by its state or its composition. And for our purposes, and when we study the periodic table, there are three states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. And you'll see on the periodic table, uh, a good periodic table, and the one I'm going to use particularly, uh, those elements that are solid at room temperature versus the others, the two that are liquid at room temperature versus the handful that are gases at room temperature are depicted in different colors. And uh, elements can exist in all three states in general. And I'm sure there's someone who said, who wants, you know, every time I uh, start talking about the states of matter, someone always raises their hand and says, no, 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 my teacher in eighth grade said there are four states of matter. And of course they're talking about plasma which is electrically charged gas, like you would find in a plasma ball. I have one, and I keep it in my classroom, but we don't have a classroom. This is all virtual, but uh, if you've seen the plasma ball, uh, that is a gas with an electric current being passed through it that has properties that don't quite align with any of these, and yes, it's another state of matter. Uh, I can take a gas and add electric current to it and make it uh, not act entirely as a gas, and yet, if you really want to go into that kind of detail and you take a rigorous 
uh, physical science course or a graduate physical science, you'll learn there are probably eight, nine, or even more these days states of matter. If you want to distinguish uh, very fine differences between them and adhere to strict definitions. So, for example, water can exist as a solid, ice. It exists as a liquid, thank goodness. has special properties that makes it particularly suitable as a solvent of life. And of course, we have liquid water. Uh, I think they're trying to show you, uh, not liquid, gaseous water uh, up in the clouds and vaporized in the, actually that's condensed water and liquid water, but um, vaporized into the air which we're very familiar with, and the humidity here in Arkansas. So, physical state, solid, liquid, or gas. The other way we classify matter is on its composition. Whether or not it's uniform throughout. Uh, if it's ha not uniform throughout, the classic examples are what? Concrete, sand, mortar or cement and aggregate uh, is a heterogeneous mixture. Hetero means different, made up of many, generated from many different parts. My favorite example is just plain old chicken soup, you know? It's very heterogeneous. I'm sorry, I'm trying to use the mouse on a presentation and it's sometimes on my touchpad making the screen go forward. So if I take out the broth and maybe separate the fat out of that broth and just have the chicken stock uh, without the fat droplets in it, it's very uniform throughout. Homogeneous or homogeneous. Homo meaning the same, of course. And so that is a type of matter, which I'll define in a minute, but it's very regular throughout. I've lost my pointer. Let's see if I can get it back. There we go. And now, the question is, does it have a variable composition? Well, yes. You know that salty chicken stock that's very uniform throughout can have different amounts of salt in it. So it, it has a variable composition and it's called a homogeneous mixture, a mixture of salt and chicken flavoring and water, and you can have more or less chicken flavoring or more or less salt. I'm sorry for the screen um, jumps, but I can vary how much salt is in there, how much is dissolved, and that is, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit, a solution a solution of salt and water, or chicken flavoring and salt and water. And the solution that's very uniform throughout, very homogeneous, is made up of different parts. The solvent that everything's dissolved in to form the solution, and the solutes which are dissolved in the solvent to form the solution. And we will talk about that when we study solutions, typically. Actually, we have a whole chapter on aqueous solutions. Or does it not have a variable composition? Then it must be a pure substance. And if it's a pure substance, it's one of those two things we just talked about. And that is, it's either a pure element made up of one and only one type of atom, or it's a compound, a molecule made up of two or more different types of atoms. You know, an element would be oxygen or hydrogen, but if I combine those together in a specific ratio, I can form water, among other compounds, maybe hydrogen peroxide. Um, or, you know, if it's pure gold, it's a pure element, okay? Um, and that is how we divide things, whether or not they're a mixture. And if the mixture is uniform throughout, we tend to 
refer to that as a very frequently a solution. So um, we've talked about all of this already. Um, elements cannot be separated into or made up of one and only one type of atom and they can't be decomposed to simpler substances. Uh, they can be reacted and uh, changed, but they'll, they'll gain in complexity when they react, for example, with air. Um, a compound is can be decomposed, although doing so is often very tricky, to two or more elements, two or more uh, substances that themselves have only one or one type of atom. And when we have a compound, those different atoms are present in very defined ratios. The best example, of course, being ah, water, H2O. Water has a definite uh, composition or the proportion of hydrogen to oxygen is definite. And we'll talk about uh, Dalton's laws and laws of constant composition, etc. Uh, a little bit later when we talk a little bit about the history of chemistry and our beginning of our understanding of atoms and how they come together to form uh, compounds. So, as we said, uh, if you have a mixture that mixture made up of two or more substances that can be fairly easily separated uh, don't require chemical means necessarily to separate them there's some gray areas there but the mixtures um, can vary in composition like chicken soup and be very heterogeneous or they can uh, be very uniform throughout as a homogeneous solution. Not all homogeneous mixtures are solutions. Uh, two metals mixed together in a very homogeneous way, one dissolved into the other, may be termed an amalgam. Uh, there are suspensions that appear homogeneous. So uh, I don't want these to become hard and fast uh, very dogmatic definitions, nor do I want to get picky and go into detail about every possible uh, derivation of types of mixtures. Okay, So, let's talk about properties of matter, because chemistry is the study of matter and its properties. And we have two types of properties, and we're going to I'm going to stop and say that again later because there are different ways to do them, to uh, separate the properties or to look at the properties. Physical properties are ones that uh, you can study without changing a substance into another substance. And these are things like density. The density of water is the density of water. I don't have to uh, react the water and change it into something else. Uh, boiling point, mass, volume, any of those uh, properties are physical properties. You know, boiling point, <coughs> excuse me, freezing point, evaporation point, those are evaporation point and boiling point mean the same thing. Condensation point may mean the same thing. Um, evaporation is a subtly different process, but um, I meant boiling point and condensation point uh, are the same thing depending on which uh, direction you're coming at. The same way freezing point and melting point are the same thing. So. Um, the other type of property is a chemical property. Uh, we describe chemical properties based on how things react. And when things react, we change the um, order and arrangement and number and type of atoms present in a substance. 
and change one substance into another. So uh, examples are flammability, uh, reactivity with water, reactivity with air, reactivity with acid, uh, whether or not it reacts and corrodes things and acts as an acid, for example, itself. So uh, physical properties deal with physical changes, changes in state, and chemical properties are properties that we study when things react. And when things react, uh, substances are changed. And there's another way to divide the properties, and you'll hear this a lot, intensive and extensive properties. Um, there are also even different ways kind of, of saying that, um, but uh, intensive properties are independent of the amount of sample that you have. How much substance is present doesn't affect it. 10 milliliters of water or 10 gallons and 10 liters of water have the same boiling point. They have the same density. And it's, no matter how much water you have, it's a clear, colorless liquid. Okay. Now, um, extensive properties depend upon how much of the substance is present. So, an extensive property would be like its volume. Do I have a tiny one milliliter amount or a large hundred liter amount? You know, and um, how much does that weigh? What is its mass? How long will it burn? How much energy does it contain? How long will it, uh, you know, stay hot? For example. Um, so that, those are extensive properties, intensive and extensive properties. So uh, similar along a similar line, physical changes are changes that do not change the composition of a substance. Classic examples are changes in temperature and changes in state. Oh, I'm so sorry, going between, for example, liquid and solid water, freezing and thawing. That's a physical change. Properties of ice are very different from the properties of water. And the density changes, that volume will change if you have a constant mass, uh, etc. But those are physical changes. The water is still water. And we didn't really, as we get on, what we'll say is we didn't make or break any bonds. Chemical changes involve making and breaking bonds between the atoms uh, in a substance, in a pure substance, or between the atoms in uh, a compound. And chemical changes would be things like burning, combustion, oxidation, which is burning and uh, combining with oxygen. O combustion is an oxidation and decomposition or breakdown of a substance. So uh, that would be uh, the other type of change. Uh, we'll talk about some changes that sometimes get a special category called uh, nuclear reactions if we get to it. So um, I've already described this. Converting between the three states of matter is a physical change. When ice melts or freezes or water condenses or evaporates, the water is still a water and the bonds don't change. If I take water and pass an electric current un through it under the right conditions, I will separate the water atoms into hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. And then if I add a spark to that mixture, I will get a very explosive combination of the two. And hydrogen is a wonderful clean burning fuel because all it does is combine with oxygen to form water. And uh, that is a, you know, your example of a chemical reaction, but we're going to be studying hundreds of chemical reactions and there are thousands of them going on in your body right now. So. Let's go back to those mixtures. If I have a heterogeneous mixture, 
this is something most students do, although I've had some problems with uh, students from our Delta here in Arkansas being exposed to experiments as they should in their high school and junior high experience, but usually somewhere around junior high, you are handed a mixture in a chemistry or a physical science class of oil, water, and some dirt or sand or mud. And they ask you to separate them. And we can separate substances based on their physical properties and on their chemical properties. But for now, we're going to stick to not exploiting chemical properties, but physical properties of a substance, actually of, a mi of the substances in a mixture to separate them. So filtration is a classic example. This looks like perhaps he formed a precipitate of a lead salt called potassium iodide. Uh, maybe not. It's a bright canary yellow, wonderful pigment used to be used in paints, but of course lead is toxic to humans, so we don't use those beautiful, brilliant lead salts anymore uh, in our paint, and appropriately so. But it's an insoluble pigment. It has to be suspended in the paint, and it's suspended in this aqueous, I assume this is an aqueous solution after a um, precipitation reaction, but it has formed what we call a precipitate. It has fallen out of solution, and it's still in there, and it's at a molecular level, so these pieces are very small, but not so small that they can pass through some specialized types of paper called filter paper. So here's a mixture of water and potassium iodide. And by filtration, the water will pass through the paper. The small water molecules will pass through the paper. And the larger lead iodide complexes uh, will be retained by the filter. And that is one of the easiest way to separate uh, solids from liquids and to um, start to separate the components of a mixture. Filtration. Another way, what happens if I have two liquids? For example, in the um, wines and spirits industry, you ferment sugars to form alcohol in aqueous solution. Um, this example uses salt water. Well, that's, I guess, even better. The salt is dissolved in the water. And we haven't talked about how ions solvate, form clathrate cages of water around them and are integrated into the structure of water. But the salt, the sodium chloride, um, ionizes into sodium and chloride ions and are accommodated in the structure of water. But if we boil the water, the salt will stay behind and we'll end up with pure water. Let me tell you what happens if this were a mixture of alcohol and water. I would heat this up slowly. I would have a thermometer to measure my temperature and water boils at 100 degrees, and alcohol, I believe, ethanol boils, I believe, 70. 78 comes to mind, too, but I think it's, uh, I'm thinking at minus 78 degrees. But anyways, uh, I think it boils around 70 degrees. So what will happen is, early on, as I add heat to this system, it will heat it up to 70 degrees, and the ethanol will evaporate or boil away and pass up as a vapor through the tubes. And this is a water-jacketed tube where cold water comes in and flows in an opposite direction, counter-current, 
to the flow of the gas coming through here and the cold water lowers the temperature of that gas and causes it to condense on the inner tube so there's a tube going through that oops through that condenser that water jacketed tube that has cool water running in the outer um, chamber and the steam that is alcohol in the inner chamber but as it hits the cold water it condenses and no longer floats away as a gas but now drips down notice it's pointing down through gravity into a collection flask and so what you're left with is pure water and what you concentrate over here is alcohol and you've separated the two because they have different boiling points salt of course uh, when you boil the water away will remain as a solid but what you do is you boil the water the solids remain behind and what you end up with is distilled water pure water in this example where they're boiling salt water and that's how you make distilled water a very pure form of water and then if you don't like it you don't think it's pure enough you can distill it again and make double distilled water um, just another way and another technique is chromatography there are many many types of chromatography um, <clears throat> high pressure liquid chromatography gas chromatography and we'll talk about gas GC mass spec gas chromatography mass spectroscopy to determine molecular structure but um, chromatography allows you to separate substances based on their um, interaction with not a solid surface but uh, in it can be the solid surface the paper or that but there may be for example in gas chromatography um, a liquid coating some beads that it interacts with but the point is is it interacts with a support and we're going to keep it simple and not talk about mobile and stationary phases but if I, for example, um, do, I like to do some paper chromatography where I draw with different inks and I show the class that there are, for example, that black Sharpie that you thought was made up of black ink is actually a mixture of black and blue ink. And some of the other ones, some of the other inks are made up of uh, different colors mixed together including some you might not expect and they separate because they travel you know you write them onto a piece of paper and then you dip that piece of paper in a solvent and the solvent carries all the ink away but the different color inks move at different rates and here's a mixture of compounds that are moving through the stationary phase at different rates and the longer and the more slowly you do this um, the better your separation and you put solvent in the top above your compounds and the solvent will move very quickly through here oops but the, the compounds will interact with whatever you have in this absorbent stationary phase they use different clays they use uh, different resins with different charges on them so if this were a negatively charged resin and C has a negative charge it would pass through very quickly but if A had a positive charge it would interact with it and be slowed down so it's a very um, simple technique in some respects and yet can get very uh, sophisticated 
in our ability to separate things. Whenever anybody has uh, a, a sophisticated drug test or chemical analysis done in a medical or forensic uh, or environmental science um, situation, there's often very sophisticated ways or techniques of chromatography that come into play. Now, one of the biggest problems people have, that's it, that's our introductory material. I want to stop and change gears a little bit and talk about the problem people have with chemistry. And we're going to talk about it and I'll demonstrate it as we go through the class. But we're dealing with atoms that are incredibly small, requiring us to use numbers to describe those dimensions that in turn are incredibly small and we, small, and we are not going to say mm. the average length of that bond between hydrogen and oxygen is 0.000000001 meters. And we're going to say it's 10 to the minus 10th meters, okay? We're going to use scientific notation. And that is, we're going to use scientific exponents. And since we're using exponents, we're going to, especially more so in second semester chemistry, where we have to describe rates and uh, values like pH, where we have to take those exponents and um, use logs to work with them. But the other thing is, is because these atoms are so very, very small, we have so many of them. So when we go to count them, the numbers are incomprehensibly large. So we're dealing with extremely small dimensions and extremely large quantities. And chemistry is a quantitative science. We have to make measurements. We have to make calculations. And we are going to do that, and I will take you through it very slowly and try and um, help you do it. Now, when we do measure, we are going to use SI units, Système International. It's French for International System. There are seven, right? Six or seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven um, units of mass, length, time, temperature, amount of substance, my favorite, electric current, and luminous intensity. For mass, the unit is a kilogram, the standard. I've seen it in Paris, a solid cylinder of the of platinum, the meter, I've seen the meter, it's at the same place, um, and it was originally, I wanted to say, defined as one one millionth of the distance between the equator and the pole. But we made a standard meter, and the beauty of this system international is long ago, of course, we had inches and feet, and feet were what? The length of the king's foot of somebody's foot and of course because um, you know the kings ruled uh, it was the king's foot and an inch I want to say it was the width of their thumb but this standardized everything and made everything so much better time seconds of course we can have units that are derived from these like minutes and hours and I'll talk about those for temperature, we're going to use Kelvin, uh, especially when we discuss gases because it, I won't say it linearizes everything, but it makes the gases behave and be able to be described in mathematical terms if we use degrees Kelvin. The amount of substance is a mole. It corresponds to 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd things. If you're talking about a mole of water, it would be molecules of water. 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd excuse me, molecules of water is about 18 milliliters, 18 cc's, 
or about a big swallow. Uh, electric current is the amp, Ampere, named after Mr. Ampere, and uh, brightness or luminous intensity, Candela. And what about the metric system? Well, uh, we're going to be using nothing but the metric system when we do our measurements. Uh, formally, the base units are a little bit different. Um, we measure mass in grams, although that's not convenient for measuring anything big like a human, so we frequently use kilograms. It's too big of a measurement for drugs, so we use milligrams, and I'll talk about those prefixes next. Our unit of length, the meter, time, seconds. Degrees Celsius or degrees Kelvin or Kelvins, we're not supposed to say degrees Kelvin anymore. Notice there's no degree degree sign, little circle, option shift eight if you're using a Mac for the Kelvin. We don't say degrees Kelvin anymore, we just call them Kelvins. Uh, but they're equivalent in um, magnitude, okay? A degree Celsius is equal to a degree Kelvin but we'll talk about them. I have one quick slide for them. Amount of substance, like I said, is the mole, and volume is the liter or the milliliter. We no longer use or say cubic centimeters or cc's, although automobile manufacturers and motorcycle manufacturers still measure their engine displacement in that. The problem with this is it led to mistakes in medical prescribing and now we use exclusively milliliters, and we follow their example. Now, <clears throat> like I say, we have these prefixes, okay? So if you have a liter, and you take one-tenth of a liter, you'll get a deciliter, as in, you know, a decade or power of 10. And we still use deciliters, believe it or not. Their example are with watts um, power measurements, and they are talking about a deciwatt there. But deciliters are what we measure uh, substances dissolved in blood in. So when I say I want my um, blood sugar below 100, um, that means, what, 100 milligrams per deciliter. Okay, so um, we, and that was because in the old days, 100 milliliters of blood or a deciliter or one-tenth of a liter of blood was how much blood you needed to measure quantities. Our chemical techniques have gotten so sensitive, so sophisticated, you know, now you can measure blood glucose in a drop of blood. So... Uh, milli is one one thousandth, as in milliliters or milligrams. A milligram is a thousandth of a gram. And you'll need to use these um, to do some conversions in our problem solving and to follow along with me because I'm not going to stop and redefine anything. I'll let you go back and look it up if you are having problems. Um, we do use nano, um, nanometers when we talk about some atomic dimensions. Um, we hardly ever use pico, femto, atto, or zepto. Those are the kind of quantities that quantum chemists and quantum mechanical physicists use. Those are subatomic distances and subatomic uh, masses, so we won't use those. Uh, occasionally, biochemists, we use picomoles, but um, that's about it. Going up the scale, of course, you know, if you have a thousand grams, you have a kilogram. If you have a thousand meters, you have a kilometer or kilometer. Okay? And mega, Probably you think of these in terms of 
uh, computer, computing power, computing storage, megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes. I remember 30, 40 years ago when I had a little Macintosh. Uh, we were talking about gigabytes of RAM and terabytes of storage. We thought we'd be in the future and doing Star Trek type stuff. And yet here we are with everyday computers off the shelf with gigabytes of RAM and terabytes of storage. In fact, my son, of course he's a senior systems engineer for Apple, has a computer with a terabyte of RAM. So, and now PETA, um, which is 10 to the 15. Notice he's from the kilo mega giga tera PETA, they go up by factors of a thousand. We need deci, um, and you sometimes see deca in here for times 10, I think in acres and some things like that, but um, in some measurements. But uh, we use centi a lot because of centigrams, hundredth of a gram, and centimeters, and those are convenient uh, measurements that we use all the time, and again with the milligrams. But after that, 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18, 21, we've got the um, powers multiplied by 1,000, not powers of 10 in that case. So let's go and talk about the basic units, and notice there wasn't a volume there. Many units are derived units. In fact, the example here of watts, watts are um, a derived unit. Uh, joules are units of energy, and they're a kilogram meter squared per second squared. So, um, and a watt is a joule per second. So these are derived, and um, to give you a better example, or at least certainly an easier example, is what about volume? Well, volume is what? Length times width times height, or in this case for the cube, one edge squared. And if you have a one meter cube, it's one meter on edge, one times one times one, okay? So, uh, and this is um, also using some interesting dimensions, decimeters, which no one really uses, but a cube is one decimeter on a side because a liter has a thousand milliliters and um, that one meter on a side gives us um, what? Um, 10 decimeters, so 10 times 10 times 10, you know, a thousand of these little squares or cubes, sorry, and each one of those is a liter. So, a cubic meter contains a pretty good volume of stuff. A liter itself is made up of a thousand milliliters. And it's very uh, convenient in that a milliliter is one cubic centimeter. And interestingly enough, if you use water, and you use water at its densest point, four degrees or so, but for our purposes, water is one gram per milliliter. It has a density of one. And it makes it possible to do all kinds of interesting interconversions. But like I said, people aren't using cc's, cubic centimeters, or centimeters cubed, for their measurements when they, for example, prescribe medicine and say, take 20 cc's. They will now say, take 20 milliliters. 
because um, there were some confusion in the cubic centimeter and its conversions. Temperature, there are three main temperature scales in use today. The Fahrenheit scale, which is what we use for our weather and our room temperature here in the United States. The rest of the world uses the Celsius scale, formerly also called the centigrade scale, where we define zero degree, the freezing point of water as zero degrees, and the boiling point of water as 100 degrees, and we divide that um, temperature difference into 100 equal intervals, okay? Now, of course, we know things can be colder than zero degrees, minus 20, minus 50, but there is a point at which things cannot get any colder, and it's minus 273.15 degrees, also known as absolute zero. And if you come up to um, zero degrees, it's 273.15 degrees Kelvin. Um, 37 degrees is body temperature, 98.6. I noticed the last time I went in to my uh, physician, uh, she wrote down, her nurse wrote down my temperature in degrees Celsius. Um, and I didn't have a fever. So, uh, we've covered all of this. Uh, the Kelvin is based on properties of gases, but it's absolute zero is the point at which all molecular motion stops. And it's really interesting how close we have come to absolute zero. Like within a thousandth of a degree but of course we haven't gotten there yet, and the conjecture is we never will. Um, Fahrenheit scale, like I said, is in America, and there's a formula for doing a conversion. I can show you, I can never remember these formulas, but I can show you how to derive them. But basically, between um, 32 and 32 degrees, which is freezing in Fahrenheit, and 212 degrees, which is boiling in Fahrenheit, you have 180 degrees. And in the Celsius scale, you have 100. Well, if you do 180 over 100, you get, what, 18 over 10, or 9 over 5. So or depending on which way you're going, five over nine. That's where those numbers come from. And since this one, the Fahrenheit scale, starts at 32, you have to add 32 degrees to it if you want to convert to degrees Fahrenheit. So it looks like a probably complicated formula that is actually uh, very logically derived. But we're not going to do that because we're just not going to use Fahrenheit temperatures. Um, I don't know why they want to throw in all of this material in a quick review in this chapter, but I will do it. Density is a measure of how dense something is. That's a relationship of its mass to its volume. Water has a density of one. Gold has a density, I don't know, I don't have my charts in front of me, over 10. Very dense. Lead has a value almost 10 seven, eight, or nine. Anyway, much denser than water. And of course, many things are lighter than water, so they can float on water or you know, float even in the air if they're less dense than air. So uh, we use uh, grams per milliliter. We won't be using grams per cubic centimeter, though you see densities a lot because physical scientists are not so concerned with errors made by pharmacists, potential errors made by pharmacists. Um, we will also um, be using um, grams per liter for things like gases because the numbers just get too small and harder to work with that way. 
So let me tell you about two things, and that is significant figures and accuracy and precision. And like I say, chemistry is a quantitative science and we need to measure things. And very often our measurements are not as precise as they could be, as they should be, or as we want them. There are two types of numbers, counting numbers or ordinal numbers. Um, I don't mean like first, second, third, or fourth, but like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay? And if you're counting money, students, eggs, you can get extremely precise values. But if you are, for example, measuring their height or their mass, depending on what kind of ruler or what kind of balance or scale you're using, your, your values will have some limitations in them, okay? Some things measure very accurately. A graduated cylinder measures much more accurately than a beaker. A, this is called a burette. A burette takes those 50 mils that might only be compressed into three or four inches and spreads it out over um, several feet, half a meter. And a very um, small change in volume can be read very accurately. And we'll talk in laboratory terms about whether or not something is to contain, TC, or to deliver, TD. But um, I think that's what they were heading at there. But my point now is all measurements have some degree of inaccuracy. And that's going to bring us to significant figures. But first, what is accuracy? Accuracy refers to how close you are to the accepted value, the true value that you should get when you measure, okay? So if you use this example, you can use basketball or throwing darts. This is very accurate. It's also very precise because they're grouped together. Precision refers to how close the measurements agree with each other. So this one is very precise. This person is throwing very precisely, just not very accurately. And if you give them a score, it's going to be zero. You know, it's going to be a very low score. This person is not throwing very precisely, but if you average the values, you're going to get a very accurate value, very accurate value whose average is close to it. And the more you throw, the more accuracy you will get. So that's just a little lesson for the lab. The more times you repeat an experiment or the more measurements you take, the more accurate you will be. So let's talk about significant figures and we're done. I'm sorry for the length of this introductory lecture, but significant figures refer to digits that are measured. They relate back to the measuring instrument, uh, ultimately. And when we use those numbers in our calculations, we want to avoid something that chemistry teachers call calculator vomit. You take two, three, or four digit numbers and you divide one into the other or multiply one by the other, you take the logarithm of one, for example, in pH, which is minus the log of the hydrogen ion concentration. You calculate pH very simply by a few buttons on your calculator. It spits out, you know, this huge long number, 7.24563222224, and that's calculator vomit because the Numbers at the end are meaningless, okay? Um, so we want to pay attention to significant figures. I'm going to give you some practice. 
and post an assignment when we do this. All non-zero digits are significant. Zeros between two significant figures are themselves significant. Zeros at the beginning of a number are never significant, and zeros at the end of a number are significant if a decimal point is written in the number. That means nothing to me. I expect it to mean very little to you. It means a lot to me, but only because I've been teaching this for 30, 40 years. Um, you learn by doing, and I'm going to post an assignment for you, your first assignment, where you can use these rules to answer the question very simply. I believe we're almost done. Um, when you manipulate numbers, add or subtract, multiply or divide, you um, use the, your significant figures correspond to the um, to the measurement with the least number of significant figures. So you may be able to measure out a very expensive chemical and get 1.4227 grams on a very accurate top-loading analytical balance. And then if you just put it into uh, a liter of water that you measured not on a balance, not in a volumetric flask, but in a graduated cylinder, which may be plus or minus 10 or 20 milliliters, you can't use all those other digits when you calculate your concentration when you put the accurately measured material into the water. So you'll use your least uh, significant value to determine your significant figures. And finally, if you had high school chemistry, you probably learned about something called dimensional analysis. It's a way to multiply values by one to change their, to change the units and allow us to convert quantities back and forth. For example, the classic example uh, that a lot of teachers use is give you a worksheet and problems on, oops, problems on converting metric to standard units, liters to gallon, miles to kilometers. We're not going to do that because we just always use the metric system in our measurements. So we don't really have to worry about those kinds of conversions. But we do have to worry about some conversions, and I'll be showing you those as we go along. Here is an example. If I wanted to convert meters to centimeters, I know that there are 100 centimeters in a meter. Or another, and those are the same value. One meter and 100 centimeters are the same value. So if I put one meter over 100 centimeters, or if I put 100 centimeters over one meter, I have one over one. And I use that ratio, that unity one over one ratio, to change my number. So if I want to convert from meters to centimeters, I can use a conversion factor where one centimeter is equal to 0 0.01 or 1 one hundredth or 10 to the minus 2 meters. And I multiply, you know. So 1 meter equals my meters cancel. I multiply meters by 1 centimeter over 0 0.01 meters, 10 to the minus 2 meters. The meters in the numerator and the denominator cancel and I end up with centimeters. And I divide this one meter, or however many meters there were here, by, oops, 10 to the minus 2. Well, if I divide by that, it's the same as multiplying by 100, and I would end up, if this value were 1, with 100 centimeters. So I converted from meters to centimeters. 
Now, a lot of you are just going to do it in your head and say, oh, I know there's 100 centimeters in a meter. But to keep things straight, we write it out. Now, if we wanted to go on and do another conversion, convert centimeters to inches, I know that there are exactly 2.54 centimeters per inch. And I can use that conversion factor because one inch and 2.54 centimeters are the same value. So I'm multiplying by one again, but changing my units. But like I said, I'm not interested in the conversion of metric units and standard units because we just can always do metric units. So I will post a quick assignment and uh, the next chapter here, uh, the next chapter is going to be divided into three parts. So I'll just do one part a day and post some one a day, which seems to be about all I can do from my home. And welcome to chemistry. And if I can do this, I will stop our screencast and see you in the next video. Please be safe.